So what was it like? Truly, what was it truly like growing up in the 60s? Well, it was tough. It was a, a tough period of time in our lives. Um, things were different. Things were very different than they are now. And ideologies were different and ethics were different and morals were different and you know there was that push there was that push there was a lot of protests there was sit-ins there was you know things like that that would take place in our world where people were vying to get their freedoms they were fighting for their freedoms and i'm talking about in countries all through the world not just in canada where i'm from but everywhere everyone was fighting for their freedoms and those freedoms were gained through a lot of hard, long, tear-jerking effort. There was a lot of sacrifices made to gain freedoms in our world. And as, as different as it is now, where those freedoms are being squashed. I mean, back in those days, protests were like, <laughs> they were the thing, they were the thing, especially in the 60s and 70s. People were striking out to have a different type of life. We had the hippies in the 70s, of which I was one. And, you know, there was, uh, they talked about free love and they talked about, you know, marijuana and, um, you know, things like that. It was a, it was a, a freer, um, it's, it's hard to describe it. It was a freer kind of like open uh, lifestyle. I mean, people would... We wore bell bottoms, we wore uh, beads, we wore um, a different uh, style of clothes, we had different venues for entertainment. I mean, we weren't, you know, um, gamers and we weren't always in front of the computer. And I mean, look at me, I'm sitting in front of a computer talking about what it was like to grow up in the 60s. And you know, I remember my mom having, here's the difference, my mom had a tiny little uh, camera, it was called a brownie camera. And I, st I still remember it. I mean, I think she still has it some I mean, she's passed, but I'm sure my siblings have it somewhere in storage. Um, but yeah, she had a little brownie camera. And I remember the tiny little TV that we had that I would watch uh, the Flintstones in and you know we walked to school and it was quite a haul for a little girl I mean I was like six seven years old and I had to walk to school and we didn't start in kindergarten we started in grade one and that's where I started my schooling was in grade one there was no pre-kindergarten to get you used to um, you know uh, meeting other people or meeting kids there was no pre-kindergarten it was you went right to grade one and you learned reading writing and arithmetic you know you learned those things and you know a lot of the times the dress code was pretty strict I went to school in a Catholic school and um, <laughs> they were strict oh my goodness the nuns were strict oh my God, they were strict. You didn't shout out in class. You didn't curse. You didn't do any, any of that stuff. You listened. And they had a pointer and they had a ruler and they had a corner where they would put this dunce cap on you and make a fool of you. And, you know, you learned. Um, I mean, your self-esteem many times would go right through the floor, right? And, you know, I came from a poor income family and a lot of times I found myself facing that pointer or facing that corner and you know um, I can't say that I have happy a lot of happy memories of growing up in the 60s and 70s 70s yeah I have a lot of happy memories from the 70s but the 60s it was tough it was tough and you know um like I said you know the old saying where they said you know we had to walk 10 miles in the snowstorm well like I said, it's not that far off because it's kind of true. It's kind of true. I mean, six years old, it looks like you're climbing Mount Everest when you're trying to get to school in a blinding snowstorm. And you know, back in those days, snowstorms were snowstorms. They weren't what you see now where you see a light dusting and everybody says, oh, visibility is nil, okay? Visibility was nil. When, when we moved from the 60s into the 70s and we moved to a farm, uh, and my mom, we had a picture window in our living room. 
and it was facing out toward the road well there was a lot of times that you couldn't even see that road because that picture window was covered to the top with a snowbank and we had to literally go outside and shovel the windows clear so you know when people say now when there's a little dust in the snow and people say oh my goodness it that it's so bad out there don't be driving well you know what <laughs> Oh, you have no idea. You have no idea. We went through that in the 60s and it was the snow, the amount of snow we got in the 60s in the winter would, <laughs> it's a far cry from what we have nowadays, right? But, and there was also the fact that we didn't have a lot of paved roads. We had a lot of gravel roads. And it was just at that time when they were putting, um, I think they were putting gravel and like a tar, a type of tar. Um, it wasn't a complete, like it wasn't pavement, but it was as close to pavement as we could get back in those days. And I remember it being on the roads and I remember, you know, that, that, it, it was a rough road it was a rough road and so a lot of the times you know the school bus couldn't make it out especially when we were living in the farm on the farm and the school bus couldn't make it out so there was a lot of times that you know during the winter that we weren't able to get to school because the bus couldn't make it up the hill <laughs> so you know and that's just something that we learned to live with right it's something that we learned to live with so there was a lot of things growing up in the 60s it was tough um, schooling was different what you were taught in school was different uh, the ethics were different the authority figures in our lives were different everybody was vying for freedom and nowadays it's like the authority figures are the ones that are trying to squash us trying to squash our freedoms and you know i say that wholeheartedly because i totally believe it and you know nobody's going to change my mind on that it, like it doesn't matter what your ideology is our freedoms are being squashed and the reason why is because I believe that nowadays in 2023 that they're seeing that when you can control a group of people you control the economics of that group of people and you control um the money you control uh, the coffers you control the big banks and you control the big industries and you control the um the monies that are coming and going okay and the big pharmaceutical companies they're making a killing on the fact that they the fda and other um, authority figures are controlling our freedoms and what we can and what we can't um use as supplements and things like that they are controlling it to a point okay and we're fighting against that but there are small small groups and pockets of people who are defending their freedoms but then there's others who are like those um i don't even know what to call them they want to fit in they want to fit in they want the authority figures to see them as you know the the yes people right i agree with you oh yeah you're wonderful you're wonderful right and they're looking for acknowledgement as the nose wipers you know what i'm saying <laughs> <laughs> the nose shiners, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay, I'm sure you know what I'm saying. But there is a group of people like that, you know, and then there's a group of the elite, and then there's the working class, and then there's me. I'm a senior. I'm uh, low income. I'm, uh, you know, below the poverty line. Indeed, when I check my, my income tax statements, I am well below that poverty line. And the poverty line is at 22000 Wow. Wow. And then you have certain specific po pockets of people who have all the riches. But then you have those people who um, are struggling. They're struggling, right? And we've seen that in the 60s. I grew up in that era in the 60s where there was, I mean, you know, we had gone, they had gone through the Great Depression and they had gone through things like that. And it was a society that was struggling to get back on its feet. And the repercussions of that were, they were tough. They were tough. You were lucky if you had a garden. You were rich. You were considered wealthy if you were a farmer and you had a farm and you had, um, you know, crops, made your own crops because you could sell those crops and you could make money on that. But you were also a landowner. And that was important back in, in those days. It was important to have that connection. Now, the big thing that, that I remember from the 60s was that we moved around a lot. We didn't own our home. Well, we did, but we lost it. Um, when, uh, 
when times got tough, it was really, really difficult to find a place to live. There wasn't, uh, there was no social assistance. There was no services like that that would help people. There were churches, but they were overwhelmed with a lot of people that were looking for help. And there was a lot of poor people, even farmers, even the farmers that were rich in my eyes because they had land and they were able to grow things. Even those farmers went through periods of, of, not having of want of need okay and there was a lot of uh, poor country folk that you know took the brunt of you know the kids at school that had a little bit more in their coffers that whose parents were a little bit wealthier and I was one of those kids I was one of those kids I was picked on because of the fact that we were poor um, but we were happy we were poor but we were happy when we lived on the farm um, I'm on the farm. My mom was able to grow vegetables and things like that. And so it kind of like sustained us over a period of time. Now, when we were living in town and we were living, I mean, we were basically um, in the 60s. It was, it was, you could survive by charity. You could survive by the churches. You could survive by um, friends, family members that had farms would kind of like, you know, help you out, give you a box of potatoes or give you a box of fruit or vegetables. I had an aunt who had an apple orchard and we ate a lot of apples and she had a massive garden, but she had a lot of children. So she had to sustain her own family, but she also seen fit to help um, her, you know, her city or town uh, relatives, which was us, we lived in town, but we struggled. It was tough, it was tough. And not only food-wise, it was tough. Um, I mean, if you wanted to go anywhere, um, the cost of a train ticket was outrageous. And there wasn't as many connections as there is now. There wasn't a lot of buses. There wasn't, uh, I mean, even transportation, right? Having a car was like a big expense in that day. So things were things were pretty tough in the 60s. It was, it was a rough go. Then as we moved into the 70s, things got a little bit easier. Things got a little bit easier because at that point in time, there were social um, outlets. There were social support uh, systems that were put in place. And I do remember, I think it was mid-70s, that things started to get a little bit better. Now, I left uh, home in 19... Mm, uh, 74 I think I left home in 1974 for the final time I went I joined the military I went off in search of finding myself but between the day that I was born in in the 60s and 1974 that period of time was very full of um, learning and growing and struggling and learning by mistakes and you know like back in the day I used to hitchhike I, I you wouldn't catch me doing it now and you wouldn't catch me doing it in my 20s or my 30s but when I was 16 I was a little bit of a rebel and so yeah I would take off hitchhiking with my friend I had a bestie and we would take off hitchhiking to a, a local town and we would you know kind of that was our experience at becoming young adults uh, you know, cigarettes, right? I mean, back in the 60s and the 70s, the advertisement was, advertising was rampant and they would show alcohol, they would show cigarettes, they would show all those type of things. And so we got sucked into that culture. And I remember being in um, Rangers, like Girl Guides, and it was at the local high school where I lived it was in the evenings at the local high school and I had two brothers and my two brothers were I think they were you know they would have been teenagers then and they were smoking they were smokers but my mom was a smoker she was a smoker her whole life so we we learned that right you learn what you're taught and that's what we learned so my brothers were smokers and I was just one of the one of the clan right so I kind of got into their cigarettes I think I stole about three or four of them and oh no it's out in the open now it's out in the open now right and um, went to the high school to the ranger meeting and me and a couple of my buddies uh, decided that we were going to try smoking for the first time and we did we did I however 
didn't go back to it. I tried that one time. I didn't go back to it until I had joined the military. And then, you know, you're away from home. Everybody's smoking. You're a young adult. You're trying to fit in. What did I do? Stupidity. I started to smoke and I smoked for 47 years. And eight years ago, I had a stroke. That morning I had the stroke, I quit. Okay, I had quit smoking, but I had the stroke that night. The anxiety was so high that I just, I, I had the stroke that night, simple as that. And things have been difficult for me ever since. So a lot of the times the decisions that we make in our life, they're gonna take us down that road. They're gonna take us down that road. And, and um, you know, I, I would hope that anyone listening to this, you know, thinks twice about it before they get sucked into that lifestyle. However, in the 60s, the advertisements were geared toward our young people. And it was geared toward the working uh, class, okay? And it was geared toward anyone, anybody who could afford the $3, or I don't even know if it was $3 in the 60s for a pack of cigarettes. I can't remember. I know a loaf of bread was like 10 cents. A loaf of bread was like 10 cents, you know? Um, things like that. So the, the prices were different. But the advertisement, uh, advertising that there was in the magazines and on the TV, and I mean, we had a small little TV, but we still had a TV. And so we still got that influence from the advertising, okay, big ab advertising companies. And, you know, they would make you look sexy with a cigarette hanging out of your mouth. And the women that were in the uh, ads had beautiful white teeth and nice skin and perfect figures. And so you, as a child, you look at that and you think, ah, I want to do that. I want to be beautiful and I want to be rich and I want to have this and I want to have that. And so I got sucked into the lifestyle. Just saying. Then as we move into the 70s and the 80s, the advertising um, had to kind of limit it a little. They had to limit it a little because of the fact that people were dying of cancer. I mean, it was like, you know, um, especially a lot of the baby boomers were like kicking the bucket quite early, right? And don't forget, they need people who, like back in those days, people that are now in their 60s, back in those days were the working class, and they needed the tax dollars from that working class people. And so there was a lot of um, kickback, and there was a lot of flack on the advertising that was encouraging these people to smoke, and it was eventually killing them, right? And um, so I don't know, I think it was in the 80s that they put a kibosh on being able to advertise. And I'm not sure, don't take my word for it, but I think it was the 80s um, that they had to uh, break, cut back on the advertising where they were showing people actually smoking, right? So they could show a pack of cigarettes, but they couldn't show you actually lighting it up and putting it in your mouth because it was seen as um, encouraging those young people or those working class people to do that, right? But they'd still sell the product. They just wouldn't encourage it by showing a person lighting up or having a cigarette. So that took place, I think it was about in the 80s. And then they started to say um, the advertisers had to stop showing um, drinking alcohol. You could show people holding it, but you weren't to show them drinking it. Now, I don't know what's taking place, but in society today, I think uh, Bud Light has got, you know, um, I, I don't know if that rule still stands, but I know that they do advertise alcohol. So I know they do advertise it. But back in, from the 60s to the 70s, it was pretty bad. And then from the 70s into the 80s, people started to wake up and they started to see the truth behind the shit that was being um, fed down our our throats that we were hearing from, you know, um, the advertising companies and that we were hearing from all these areas where they were looking to make money off us. We were the guinea pigs. And we fell for it. We fell for it. So a lot of things. There was a lot of things. The advertising was different. Clothing was different. <laughs> Clothing was way different. <laughs> way different. <laughs> I mean... Sure, the, there was the occasions, uh, occasional uh, plumber's butt, right? But now <laughs> you get to see the whole pipe. 
<laughs> so, you know, I'll talk about that on, a, on another video, but I just wanted to talk about um, from the 60s, how different things were. Things were different. I remember, um, you know, being taught by the nuns and having a strict um, code of ethics and a very strict, if you strayed from that code of ethics that they taught you, you suffered the consequences. And I'm, I'm sure I'm not the only one out there who has uh, had the benefit of that big leather belt or a pointer, okay? Or a dunce cap, okay? And I mean, seriously, they, it affected your self-esteem. It really, truly did. And I thought that my educational years in the 60s were based on basically abuse and control. And that's what they did. They controlled us to the point where our creativity uh, was stifled many times. Um, it, it was just, it was a whole different ball game. It was a whole different ball game. Now, they said uh, many times that, you know, spare the rod and spoil the child. But a lot of people back in those days that were dealing with, you know, the um, the repercussions of the Great Depression that they had gone through and perhaps they lived through it and perhaps they were still seeing that there was wastefulness. And so, you know, a lot of those people, they would take their frustration or their anger out on those in their close circle of, circle of um their family, their nuclear family, okay, or their even extended family. And so a lot of the times these people were struggling with their own um, anxieties, okay. And so I personally think that the 60s was tough. I think that it was tough emotionally, psychologically, physically. Uh, I mean, I remember going to the cupboard and I remember there being nothing, nothing in it nothing at all except for a can of lard yeah and my mom was so creative like I'm going to tell you a few stories and my mom has passed so it's not like I'm breaking any confidences but I do remember my mother um she could make a meal out of anything basically she could make a meal out of nothing okay because we went through that period of time where there was nothing in the house, nothing. And we had a grandmother that lived close, and sometimes she would help and sometimes she wouldn't. And then we had an aunt who lived in the country who bought us food, food many times from her farm. My mother grew a garden in the backyard, so we had potatoes and things like that. When we were able to have that when my mom actually was able to get the potatoes to replant them to grow a garden okay and things like that so things were really tough I do remember sunflowers I remember my mom planting sunflowers in the backyard I do remember that um, I don't remember a lot of um, specifics about food and things like that because we were very very poor but as I said my mom could make a meal out of anything and she would make like I remember her making they called them spit pancakes because we didn't have like we didn't have we didn't even have frying pan like back in those days we were pretty poor and I'm I'm this is no crap I'm not I, I, I would think that anyone that went through what I've lived through in the 60s would understand, okay? But um, as for a frying pan, I can't say we didn't have a frying pan, but what I can say is we didn't have the ingredients to fry in a frying pan. So we didn't have butter, we didn't have oil, we didn't have things like that. But my mother rendered the lard that she would get from my aunt, um, you know, and so she would use that lard, and la that lard actually was beneficial for us because it helped and she would have flour and I remember her making pancakes and normally in pancakes you would put um, baking powder and baking soda okay and flour and sugar and all that right well my mom taught me uh, the poor man's way of making pancakes yeah yeah if you don't have baking powder or you don't have baking soda, you can just use flour and water. And that's what I did. 
many times when I went through that, um, I, I would utilize the fact that you can actually make pancakes by mixing up the flour with the water and making a paste and frying it. And my mom would do that. She would do that. She would use lard on, we had a wood stove. And I remember her stoking the wood stove and we didn't have money to buy wood. You know what I'm saying? It was bad. But we did have a wood shed and I think, I don't know, but I think that my aunt helped to supply us with the wood, the lumber that we need or wood that we needed for the fire in the winter especially. But I remember being really cold a lot of winters. But anyhow, so... Um, yeah, she would stoke up the fire. She would get the, the top of the fire, the, the wood stove, really, really hot. And then what she would do is she would take that flour and water that she has mixed up and she would, she would grease the top of the stove with the lard, right? That's rendered from the fat of the animals. And she would grease the top of the stove and she would slap down that pancake batter and flip it over and I will tell you that was the best pancake mix I've ever tasted. <laughs> when you're hungry and that's all you got, it tasted amazing. And there were times that she was able to get like cinnamon and she would spruce it up with a little bit of cinnamon and you know there were times when she was, a, she was able to afford a can of honey you know and so we'd have honey with our pancakes but a, we ate a lot of pancakes a lot of pancakes there was a lot of pancakes made back in the 60s i'll tell you that much it was a rough go it was a rough go it was really tough when you watch and you know i was a little girl then but when you watch a woman a young mother and she was she was she wasn't uh, she had six children and she was a single mother and lived in a town where there was no work at that time for single mothers, okay? She actually, uh, to make money for food, my mother would sew, sew doll clothes for a local um, auction house. I think it was an auction house. It was like a thrift house that they had uh, in another town. And they would actually bring my mother eggs. And she would sew, sew doll clothes and she would make blankets and things like that. So they would bring her um, old coats. And she would take the lining out of the coats, uh, especially the felt coats. And she would cut the squares and she would sew the squares together and make blankets. Wow, like, and make a little bit of money. And if not money, they would trade off with her doing that work for food that they would grow on their farm. And it was a thrift, uh, kind of like a thrift charity. And they had a farm. And uh, they were based on a Catholic religion at that point in time. And um, I think they still are. I think they're still in existence. And they would literally barter with my mother. They would bring her the coats and she would do the sewing and she would make the doll clothes and they would give her eggs and they would give her like, remember the old bologna and the wax bologna? They would give her a big thing of the bologna. They would give her uh, meat that was um, chicken and things that were uh, fed and grown on their farm. So, you know, there were periods of time where my mom would utilize those charities in order to feed her kids. And she did well. She did well. We all, we all, you know, live to be, I mean, we're all in our 60s, 70s, maybe, I think my brother would be in his 80s, but we're all up in age and we all survived. I mean, it was a struggle. It was a big struggle. And there was a lot of rough times back then, but we survived. And I think it made us stronger mentally and physically um, to go through all those rough times, you know. So um, I certainly don't remember very extravagant dinners. I don't remember very extravagant um, Christmases, um, especially in the 60s. In the 70s, things started, as I said, started to get better. But in the 60s, we're, we're going to focus on the 60s right now. It was really tough. It was tough. There was no big uh, fancy Christmas tree with this decorations and load it with Christmas presents, okay? There was none of that. There was none of that. Um, we did put up, my mom would put up a tree. Yeah, she would put up a tree. And I don't know where she got it. And um, it was a real one. And I do remember making the little uh, paper um, things to decorate the tree with. I, rem I remember that. I don't remember in the 60s. Okay, we're talking the 60s. I don't remember ever having a turkey, ever having even a chicken for Christmas. Um, 
and like I don't know how to stress to you how blessed we are now in 2023 because back in the 60s in my life we were lucky if we had the egg that the chicken laid for Christmas dinner so you know be thankful for what you have right now because we've come a long way uh, from where this country started from where um, I started from where my childhood um, memories come from I've, I've come a long way I've come a long way I mean right now I only eat a meal a day but that's for my health and my budget and let's be honest and my budget I mean it works right it works but back in those days as a young girl like it was tough it was tough I remember um, not being able to take a lunch to school when I was uh, in grade one and I was six and it was quite a piece to my school, so I had to walk to school. And I remember not my mom not having any bread or any meat or anything for sandwiches for lunch. Um, well, you know, she had six kids, and so I used to have to walk home for lunch, right? And uh, I remember the one thing I specifically remember um, that I couldn't stay at school for lunch, so I walked home. It was quite a piece, and, you know... For a little girl, that's a long way to walk. It was a long, long way to walk. And I'd get home and I'd be hungry. And I remember the specific one time that my mom had got a loaf of bread from a local uh, convenience store just down the road. I think they called it, um, I think it was called Chippiers. It was called Chippiers. And it was a little grocery store. And the woman there and her sons ran the front counter. And I remember my mom getting me to run down and get a loaf of bread and maybe, you know, whatever from the store, right? So I remember this one particular time. And I don't know why this stands out in my memory because it's so, like, not important. It, it, it's just, it's nothing, you know, it's nothing I define, okay? It, but I do remember walking home and... Uh, I remember there was a house on the corner and it was a big brick house. It was really beautiful and fancy. And I remember having uh, daydreams and visions of, you know, living in that house, right? And we'd go home on my lunch hour. I'd watch the Flintstones. I would eat. My mom had made um, a salmon sandwich. Now, a lot of people don't like salmon. But back in the day, you used to be able to get a tin of salmon, and my mom could make it into this big meal. She could make it into, like, she'd mix it with eggs and onions from my aunt, and she would make it into, like, this um, tuna pie, right? But also, she would make tuna sandwiches with, with mayonnaise or relish, whatever she had. And I remember going home, and I remember having a salmon sandwich at lunch hour and watching Freddie Flintstone. So, you know, a lot of the memories, they're not bad. They're not bad. A few other ones was, um, I do remember having a pair of Pluto slippers. And I love those slippers. I love them. But a family member um, ripped them. <laughs> I'll never forgive him. <laughs> he ripped them to pieces. Yeah. So, so, yeah, I had this Pluto pair of slippers that I had got, and I might have got it for Christmas. I don't know, because the gifts were simpler then. They weren't, you didn't get this big TV set, and you didn't get a Nintendo. You were lucky if you got a teddy bear, and that's what I got. A lot of the times, you would get fruit. People would give you fruit as a gift, and that was good for us because we were poor. So, But I do remember... Um, Madonna House. It was called Madonna House. That's what it was called. It was a charity thrift place. It was, and they had this big farm, and they had this area where they would have, um, you know, thrifted stuff. People would donate stuff, and they would bring us donated stuff. And I remember getting this um, yellow pinafore dress. Oh, it was so beautiful. I loved this dress. I loved it. I loved it. I loved it. It was frilly and it was bright and it was happy. And you know, our lives were not that happy all the time. Okay. And so I loved that dress. Absolutely loved that dress. I remember wearing that dress. And I remember my mom had brought a kitten to the house. And you know, when, when you're a child and you don't have a lot and somebody gives you something, you just want to squeeze it, right? You want to hold it. You want to hold it forever. You don't want to let it go. And so I remember this little black and white kitten. 
I think it was black and white and I remember them giving it to me to hold on to and I was like five or six and I remember wearing this little yellow dress and I squeezed a kitten so hard because I didn't I loved it I didn't want to let go and it pooped all over my yellow dress yeah so I don't know what happened to the kitten. I don't know if the kitten, you know, if I hurt the kitten, I don't know if the kitten, because I was like in shock. I was like in shock because that was my favorite dress, right? Anyway, I don't remember seeing the dress after that, and I don't remember seeing the kitten after that. So, yeah, you know, there was some times that kind of stand out in memory, and I just wanted to kind of, I think it's healing for me to talk about the things that affected me and the things that... Um, led me to this journey of healing that I'm on now and you know I was I was a child of the 60s I went through the hippie stage in the 70s and there is more to come because there I mean we're in 2023 so I've been there done that bought the t-shirt and this is just kind of telling you that you know what be happy for what you have now be if you have a, a home where you have your own bed be happy I didn't have that I slept in the attic and there was uh, four of us that had to sleep in that attic on one mattress. Yeah, yeah.